we went from 1 million in our first year to 11 and a half million in the third year. But then going forward from that, in the last four years or so, we went from 14 million to 20 to 33 to 42. Hey, today we dive into Fraser Smeaton's epic journey from a simple idea to a booming costume empire. It's been a successful business. We've had our ups and downs. We had a great start, became the world's most popular costume a couple of years after we launched it. But fast growth exposes your weaknesses that you don't even know about and you have to go back and fix them. Master the art of pivoting and why having a solid team is crucial to ride fast way for success. Then we have these sort of principles that we roll by. Everyone succeeds or fails together. We're in this together and we're either going to make it work together or we're all going to fail together. Discover how tech and data analytics can boost your business. So we need to keep using the data that we have to focus us on and that's where AI plays a big part in that. And this is all done under intense pressure because you are growing fast, so you have to make the decisions fast. Get ready for a tale of innovation, resilience, and chasing excellence. And my biggest learning is the one that got us going, which is to... Hey, Fraser Smeaton, welcome to the High Performance CEO Show. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be on. Today we talk about, a, it could be a funny subject, fancy costumes. <laughs> you run a very successful company, Morph Costumes. Yes, we've been selling costumes now since 2009. We started with spandex suits, but now we have a range of over a thousand different costumes, everything from witches, zombies, skeletons, hippies, anything you can think of. We've either got it or we're developing it. Amazing. And it seems to be a very successful business. Yes, it's been a successful business. We've had our ups and downs. We had a great start at the beginning with the morph suit. It became the world's most popular costume a couple of years after we launched it. Then we had some difficulties when we learned some lessons about how to deal with fast growth and how to pivot to where we've got to. And then we've gone through a second stage of really fast growth that was then interrupted by the pandemic. So it has been an interesting journey. Interesting story. Yeah. So let's start in the beginning. So how did you got into this? I mean, how did you develop this idea to create a company selling costumes? I mean, was this a typical being in a pub with some friends and nothing to wear for the next fancy dress party? Or how did you get into this business? It wasn't quite being in a pub with some friends, but it wasn't far away. M myself and my two other founders, one of whom is my brother and the other is an old friend from university. We had been dabbling in some side hustles in the past and looking for business ideas. And they hadn't been successful. But at the same time, with a group of friends, we had been on a boys' trip to Dublin. And it was a fancy dress trip with some sports involved, <laughs> including a ridiculous 100 meters race. And one friend had bought a spandex suit to try and streamline himself for this 100 meters race. And in order to economize, yeah. when we went out for some drinks afterwards, he kept wearing the suit. And 200 people must have asked him where he got it from. Hundreds of people took his photo and we'd worn fancy dress costumes before, but we'd never seen a reaction, anything like this. So we thought, wow, that's amazing. And then we wore it to a couple that's... more events and the reaction was always the same. So that's when it dawned on us. We should give up working on our other side hustles that were struggling and we should try and sell yeah. these costumes. That's what you want. A right? business idea that completely goes to the roof without you doing anything. <laughs> Just going to a pub and dressing up. So for everyone who's not, what is a spandex suit? A morph suit, which is an all-in-one spandex or lycra stretchy material suit oh. of originally one color. It would cover you from head to toe, but because the material is stretched across your face, you can still see out of it, but no one can see you. And that contrast of your invisibility while still being able to see and move around, I think was part of the fact that people could be a more fun, uninhibited version of themselves while also being in the center of attention. And that was really the powerful special source that helped get that business off the ground at the beginning. Awesome. So this is a, quite a simple idea, yeah, but it's not so simple to make this a reality and turn this into business. So where do you start? So we started, and this links back to the other side hustles we tried because we'd been, we'd attempted other ideas in the past. We knew how to do some of the things. We knew how to get a website built cheaply, but we didn't know how to source products. So we had to go onto Google and work that out. And we found Alibaba, which was less well known in those oh, yeah. days. And that allowed us to find some factories and we put out a pitch document and three came back to us. It quickly became apparent that one only spoke Chinese this before translation engines. So we weren't going to be able to communicate with them. And that the other one was middle manning for the same original factory. So we were down to one. So that's where we could start. And we negotiated with them for a first order of 200 suits in across six colors. 
we didn't have a warehouse. So these were sent to my room in a young professional's flat in London. I had probably underestimated how much space 200 morph suits took up. I think it was about at least half the room. So there wasn't a lot of room for sleeping. We each put in a thousand pounds of our savings at that point, And we spent 2000 on the initial order and we had a thousand left over for a website. And it was a pretty poor website, but I think that almost helped prove the idea. And it links back to, I think that you should always test your ideas cheaply and quickly because you never know. You can do all the research you want to do. You can get, gather as much evidence for the hypothesis as you want to do. But until the rubber hits the road or the product hits the consumer, you never know for sure how successful it's going to be. And because we started it cheaply and quickly, and actually the website wasn't great, it was further proof that the idea was really strong because people had to battle through this terrible website in order to purchase the products. They really wanted it. So they took all this burden and accepted a shitty website still to get the... the Absolutely. Yeah. A shitty website with terrible delivery times because we were literally taking them to the post office ourselves in our lunch breaks from our corporate jobs and writing the envelopes by hand. But they really wanted it. As you said, those first 200 sold out in less than a week. I had three or four people who somehow had found my address on the internet and knocked on the doors to buy them. And they were just all the signals that we knew we were onto a big success. Oh, wow. That's amazing. How often we, and I also tried many things in the past, you know, but something like this is really what you would dream of, yeah? Something, boom, you have a minimum viable product and it goes through the roof. And then you can build on that and you can really optimize the process and get a proper website, everything, but you do it on a success path, you know, and not like many of us struggling and trying to make ends meet while they develop the, the product or service. Yes, exactly. We have seen both sides of that. Other ideas weren't successful. And so you're always working harder to push what I would describe as push water uphill. But when you have got an idea that's as powerful as that, doors just open for you because everyone wants to know about it. Everyone wants to hear about it. Buyers from stores want to have meetings with you. Factories mm. want to know you because they know they're going to do big orders. And as you say, you can then yeah. refine everything from a position of power. But is this not a seasonal business, the costume market? The costume market is definitely seasonal and Halloween is our biggest season, but it's probably less seasonal than people and myself included before I was in the industry would expect. So our biggest day at Halloween will be around 15 times our smallest day, but there are lots of other seasons, not quite as big as Halloween, but still make a big difference to us. So Christmas, lots of Christmas costumes, whether it's nativity or Santa Claus, et cetera, get sold. You then have European carnival as a man in Germany, you'll know about that. So across Italy, Spain, Germany, the Netherlands, we have a great season around Lent. I always joke that in Britain, we get like pancake day, whereas you get a three day costume party with beers added on top. I think we get the wrong end of the stick on that. Then in the UK, you've got book day, which is when all the kids go to school dressed as a character from their favorite book. So that gives us an extra one. Easter bunnies, St. Patrick's day. And then we go into sort of just summer and people are having barbecues. They'll dress as pirates. They've got hippies for festivals, etc. So there is plenty of year round demand. And that's what our eyes were open to when we, we first went to a trade show in the US a year into our business just with the sort of British expectation of how Halloween was 15 years ago, which wasn't that big. Um, and we get there and we find these massive businesses. There are two or three families in the US that are billionaires from selling costumes. So it was a really nice sweet spot of you've got this really large yeah. industry, but it didn't have the sophistication you might find if you went into beauty or toys, etc. So there was plenty of space to grow, but there weren't huge barriers to entry. Uh, and there's a lot of room for error, I imagine. Something you just try out. And as you said, it's not so sophisticated, this business. Yes, exactly. You can try lots of things and mm. there, there is space for error, both in your costume designs, as long as you test small numbers of them, and also in working mm. out your processes and what sells and what doesn't. So it was a nice space mm. to sort of gain experience in running our own businesses. So you started with friends and, and your brother, you said, and now you have a large organization or how big is Morph Costumes, I may ask? So now we have 40 people in the UK and we have another 10 people based internationally. But starting a business with family and friends, I mean, you have a relationship to that. Yeah? You have, of course, family relationship, but also friendly relationships. And then getting into business is a completely different game. Yeah? You have uh, different topics and uh, you also have different challenges. So how did it work for you? How do you maintain your friendship and your family relationship while doing business at the same time? This is something I have thought a lot about. And I, it goes back to the beginning when I don't think my parents were particularly impressed when they heard we were going to business with my brother because or you only hear about the horror stories of families falling out around business. Yeah. But actually, 
one of our greatest achievements through this 15 years is the fact that we are better friends now across the three of us than we ever were beforehand. And we've managed to do that despite the stresses and strains, successes and failures of a fast growing businesses. And I think there are lots of positives of doing a business with family and friends. If you get it right, you, you go on a great journey and you share lots of great experiences with people you really like, but it is hard to get it right. And I, I guess my thoughts on it are three is better than two because looking at other businesses, it reduces the pressure or the intensity of that relationship. And it gives you a release valve when things do get intense as they inevitably will. So you, if you're having a discussion on some issue with someone else or they're annoying you or whatever, you can go to the other founder, someone who understands mm. the pressures, understands the stresses, and they can just give you that different perspective. You can have a good moan about the other person and they can say, no, you know, they're a good guy. It's all all right. Yeah. Whereas I think when you can be, when it's just two, no one else understands. Yeah, it's always stuff. focused on each other and there's no exit. There's no way to release pressure and, and tension. Get a different opinion. You know, often we are so caught up in our own worlds and our own belief system. Often it's just a different perspective we need to move the needle. That's exactly it. Uh, so we didn't plan that, but I'm grateful we are three, not two. Then we have these sort of principles that we roll by. Everyone needs to pull for the business and not for themselves. So you're always pushing the business forward. And if that happens, then you look after yourselves. Everyone succeeds or fails together. If we look back over these 15 years, we all have big wins that have really moved the business forward. And we all have disastrous mistakes. But never after any of those, either way, has anyone come back and said, I deserve to get paid more this year, or I deserve a greater yeah. shareholding, or anyone has tried to pay someone less because of that. And that way you don't waste your time or your emotional energy or your relationship worrying about that kind of stuff. We're in this together and we're either going to make it work together or we're all going to fail together. Yeah, it's an equal playing field, no? And it's very important to, as you said, that someone takes the advantages and the benefits of a, of a success and someone gets blamed for a mistake. You're all in together and so you should celebrate the wins and also talk about failures together. Yeah. But I mean, as you said, it, it was a fast growing success. Yeah, I mean, you developed an amazing organization organization now, but you obviously also had growing pains, I guess. Yeah. I mean, putting a str strategy, a structure in place, you need leadership teams, you need to develop your people, you need to develop the culture. I mean, there are so many aspects of entrepreneurship. What did you find the most difficult one in terms of growing this organization? We have experienced both fast growth and fast decline. And I can tell you that fast growth is one of the best feelings I've ever experienced. It is so exciting, but fast decline is one of the worst feelings I've also experienced. Yeah. And on the way up, I remember several occasions we launched in the May and then we got a sort of second restock in October. And I remember we did 5,000 pounds one evening and I was just blown away by that. And then about a year later, we launched in the U S and it was another day in the run up to Halloween. And We were watching our sales run neck and neck with the time on the 24 hour clock. So it was like 10 PM and we'd done $22,000 and we were like, this is unbelievable. We just couldn't believe it. I mean, they were huge numbers and we, and we were selling spandex suits and that was so positive. But yes, then when it was on the way down, it's really, really hard and you have to work through that. But we'll focus on the growth bits and the pressure that that puts on you. Very positive, good feeling. As you said, we're doing it from a position of strength, but fast growth exposes your weaknesses, many that you don't even know about, and you have to go back and fix them. And I, I remember in one of those early years, we were working with a warehouse out in Essex and you just assume they have limitless capacity or DPD in this case have limitless capacity, but of course it's a local franchisee who's running that. And we were filling their van beyond capacity. So they basically <laughs> ran out of vans. And you don't think that that is a thing that can happen. Oh, crazy costume guys again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> correct. Exactly. It's October. So we're going to, we're going to need to get a bigger truck. So, and then suddenly that's right at your most intense period when everyone needs their costume by Halloween and you're falling behind yeah. on your delivery schedule because of something you didn't even know existed and you thought was limitless. And we've seen that as well. We ran out of space in our 3PL a couple of years ago as we grew coming out of the pandemic. Again, we thought this was limitless space in the warehouse because it's a giant warehouse. But we ended up having to store stuff in a really expensive secondary warehouse while you were doing that. There's other things like the complexity increases. As you roll out internationally, you start tripping tax thresholds in different countries. And suddenly you're yeah, getting letters yeah. from the tax authorities in Poland and the Czech Republic. And you've got to have systems oh. in place to make sure you handle that. Yes. And this is all done under intense pressure. 
because you are growing fast. So you have to make the decisions fast. And that obviously decisions that are made fast are often not your best decision. But what we've kind of learned, and it's a bit of a cliche, but like a lot of cliches, there's real truth in the middle of it. If you can hire great people and put your effort into that, and these are people with great problem solving skills, it does take a particular skill set in a fast growing business because you don't have all the information. So you have to deal with ambiguity and people who can make decisions and solve problems with incomplete data sets, put them in the right roles and give them clarity on the vision. Then you get support in solving those problems fast as they come up. But you also have to accept you're going to make mistakes and you just have to deal with them as quickly as possible. Make sure you fix the critical ones. Don't worry about the other ones. And then as soon as you've got time, you go back and loop back around and fix the other businesses. And if you're continually fixing things and continually improving your processes. It's not my idea, but it's in incremental gains that David Brailsford talks about. And you're continually improving oh. every little bit before you know it, you are miles further forward than you thought you were. And for example, in our growth phases, the first one, where we went from 1 million in our first year to 11 and a half million in our third year. And then we had the tough times. And after another four years, we'd reduced it back down to 6 million. Then going forward from that, we went in the last four years or so, we went from 14 million to 20 to 33 to 42. And so we've gone through it all again, and it's put different pressures on the business, but we've taken the lessons from the first growth period and the mistakes we made there, and we got the right people in place this time. And we've gone through it a lot more smoothly than we did the first time. Making mistakes, learning from the mistakes, and then uh, you do another round of growth and you implement what you learn. And I think personally, I think also having the right culture is important, allowing people to make mistakes that they're not afraid. Because only when you make mistakes, you learn. Most of what we do nowadays in our business, we haven't done before. Yeah? So we have to try out. And this is the biggest challenge I see with our education system, because kids are taught not to make mistakes in school. Uh, and I often ask myself, how will they be able to survive in the world outside, you know, if they're not able to make mistakes, if they're afraid to failure? That's a really good point. I have three children, eight, six, and four, and I spend a lot of my time when I'm not working, helping them with their homework, etc. And I'm going to take that on board because they need to be able to make mistakes. And I'm perhaps one of those people who's maybe a bit hard on them when they are making mistakes with their maths and things like that, whereas actually they do need to be able to make those mistakes and learn from them. And I think this goes back to something you said earlier about at the beginning and about how we focus on testing things quickly and testing things mm. cheaply. And therefore your mistakes are not too destructive if they go wrong. So we will always be supportive of people in this business, trying something new, as long as they followed that process, even if it doesn't work, I would rather have someone who worked here and promote someone who worked here, who is making lots of small, thoughtful mistakes than someone who just sits there and never tries anything else. But that's the crucial bit. Have they gone through that process? Have they looked at the evidence that's in front of them, developed a hypothesis, found more information to try and support that hypothesis, then built a plan that allows them to test it quickly and cheaply, but also that they understand how they would scale it if it actually works. And if they do that, they can have 10 wrong ideas, but one good idea will far outweigh those 10 wrong ideas. And that's how you move. Exactly. That's how you move forward. And it's really at the core it's of like, what we try and do. It's like being an investor. I mean, I'm a business angel, so I invest in startups and you need one which is really going through the roof, you know, and then this one could pay for the mistakes, the others one. We yeah. look at that all the time. And sometimes I get excited. We say we, we have a new style of lead image, say on Amazon, and it looks like it's converting yeah. really, really well and driving more click through. And we get excited and we think that's going to be the future, but then you get more data. It's not, it's not actually improving uh. things in there. But the good thing is we'll have a pipeline of other tests behind it. And if we've got those other tests coming, when you get that one, it can move the whole business forward 10%. And when you're a big business, that makes a big difference. So I imagine the majority of your work or your people focus on marketing and sales. So yes, absolutely. So there's a balance. We have a lot of people focusing on marketing, sales, direct to consumer e-commerce, which is where our strength really lies. But also we are quite a complicated business on the SKUs and operation side. Costumes is a long tail game. We have 1,100 different designs, which come in four different sizes. And we sell them okay. across eight or nine different territories. So you can do the multiplication oh. on the SKUs. <laughs> so actually probably equally, it would be three thirds, the marketing and the sales, the consumer facing side of what we're doing, okay. the oh. operation side, making sure the products are of the right quality and in the right place. 
And then actually the finance team making sure that we are doing all that profitably because you're yeah. talking about small amounts of money on each costume that scales very quickly. So if you've got your costs wrong in one place, that multiplies up very quickly and you can find out you're making a lot less money than you thought you were actually going to make. So having those three areas working in conjunction is the key to what we do. Did you ever like to take on investment capital? Yes, we did. We have been working with the Business Growth Fund. They're a UK firm who have investments in over 200 small and medium-sized businesses. They have a minority state and they claim, well, they do more than claim, they live up to being long-term patient capital because they've been very patient with us. They've been in for 12 years and they have been through the ups and downs of this business. And because of that patience, they invested when we were 11 million and we're now up, at, as I said, 42 million. So we'll give them a good return on their money and reward them for that patience. So they've been great. So it's a really serious business you're running, but I, I could imagine there's also a serious side of costumes. Yeah. It's not only fancy dressing up, having fun. I think there's also a psychological aspect of putting on costumes. Oh, definitely. And you can see that when obviously a lot of the world has been suffering from declining disposable incomes, but actually costume sales remain pretty resilient. People want to have fun when times are tough. And you can actually see that from other industries that you wouldn't think are adjacent, but things like the confectionery industry, it gives you an affordable treat or maybe less, more harmfully, the alcohol industry. But people yeah. reward themselves with those little treats in the tough times. And costumes are absolutely part of that. So our sales stay strong in these tough times because it's a reasonably priced way to have some fun and to make some special memories, whether that's with your kids or with your friends or for a birthday party or whatever it happens to be it ticks that box so it stays pretty strong amazing so how do you see this business developing i mean covid turned into something which is permanently there but not so threatening anymore but we have other crises war in europe and so on so i guess there's still also high demand for people escaping reality and uh, putting on a costume there's a lot of development in technical space um, a lot of ai and marketing and sales so how do you prepare your company for the future what are the plans so in terms of the big shocks that you know the war in europe or other things like that i, I we just focus on having a resilient company and then dealing with it no one can predict what's going to happen mm. obviously covid was really tough for the costume industry we are a social product that is involved in parties yeah. and yeah. gatherings and you know, european mm. carnival was cancelled for two years halloween didn't really happen for one so it was it was tough but you make the best of what's put in front of you and we spent that time doubling down on understanding our processes and improving what we did so that we were ready to grow when demand came back. That is it, exactly how it's played out. So that was tough. But from now we're looking forward, we are going, uh, we have three prongs to our growth. We've got more products, more channels, and more geographies. And it's on the product side where AI is really helping us at the moment. And people describe it as fuel to the fire. And that's definitely how we use it. So we still have a lot of costumes that we need to add to our range. Despite having 1,100, this is a really long tail game with lots of different themes. And I always marvel how many we have, but how many we're still missing. Uh, the story I tell to people is that last year we didn't have any women's witch costumes. We were still a big company, but somehow we didn't have any women's witch. We've now added four different women's witch designs. But there's lots of examples like that. So we need to keep using the data that we have to focus us on where there are gaps to the range and add to our range. And that's where AI plays a big part in that. It helps us find and structure the data so that we can see the insights that we need to have. It helps our designers come up with new concepts. So it helps them, a new jumping off point, we would describe it. So you might get an idea for a pirate, but there are lots of ways you can execute a pirate. And sometimes the creative process just needs a nudge to say, oh, that's a different color scheme that really works together or that. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. And because AI can create 50 different jumping off points that you can scrum through and go rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Oh, I like that one. That really helps. Yeah. Design another pirate, not execute in the execute way. Yes. Yeah. yeah sorry. Designing an execution of a pirate. No, we're not, we're not making anyone walk the plank. Yeah. And then we can, we can speed the prototyping. And it can support our content creation. You know, we can use it for editing photos. We can use it for improving the videos. And all of that helps us get more products to market. And we have actually within our group, we have within our team, we have a teams group, which has 29 of our 50, I'm just checking it this morning, had 29 of our 50 people on it, where everyone is finding new ideas for AI that they think could be applicable to the business and sharing it out. So we have that flow of ideas because there's so much change that's out there. Yes. So yeah, it's been really powerful so far. And then as I say, more, more channels, we're, we're very strong on Amazon, but we also have a brick and mortar wholesale business. So we sell to Walmart and Target and other big American retailers. And we think there's lots of potential for growth with those partners. 
And then we want to scale across secondary marketplaces. So yes, Amazon is the dominant player worldwide, but there are hundreds of either secondary or local leaders like Ball.com in the Netherlands or Allegro in Poland, where we don't list our products yet. And we have assets in terms of our products. We have the imagery, we have the product designs, we have the content, we know what the keywords are. These are all assets in the business. So using those assets more effectively or getting more juice out of them by listing them in other places where consumers are is a big priority for us. And then oh. finally, yeah. just going to more geographies. So spe costumes, speed to consumer is important. Most people have a party coming up and they, they go, oh God, I forgot, I need a costume. So the quicker you can get the costume to the consumer, the more competitive advantage you have. So we launched into Canada last year with local stock mm -hmm. instead of shipping from the US and we've, we've, that, that business has grown multiple hundred percent. We're going to put local stock in Mexico and we expect the same to happen there. And we're continuing, continuing to do that as time and cash allows. And that again is building another underlying asset that we will have this international network of distribution where we can plug more and more products into it so it can scale much more quickly. Because the next 10 costumes we design can then go into more marketplaces and more geographies and therefore deliver more revenue than they could if we just design 10 products and only sold in the UK on one platform. You just mentioned speed to consumer. I guess the pressure is increasing from the, from the consumer side to be delivered fast and without any major delays. And last week, my toothbrush broke. At five to midnight, I ordered one on Amazon, a new one. Next day at 11 on a Saturday, they rang the bell and delivered it. You know, I said, this is crazy. But if, if this takes two or three days, it, hey, I mean, what's wrong? Did you forget me? Yeah. Well, in the past, a week or two is just, was just standard. Uh, when you deliver some, order something online, never expected it to have it in two days and not even the next day, or you have same day deliveries in the big cities. So you have to have stock everywhere. Yes, exactly. And so that, again, part of that finance team and that operations team that we talked about is making sure that we can forecast the stock of this huge number of products that we have. So we have just the right amount in the right places. Mm. So we do that half in the merchandising, but we also leverage Amazon's incredible logistics that you talked about. And it's obviously one of their main pieces of competitive advantage to be able yeah. to deliver to the consumer at that speed and at a reasonable cost. Now, the other logistics providers are catching up on that, but Amazon's staying ahead. They, particularly in the US, our biggest market, they have changed expectations from, as you said, two weeks ago, a long time ago. But Prime used to be two to three days to last year. They were getting more than 50% of their Prime orders, I believe, delivered next day in the US. And for a seasonal business like us, that is actually phenomenally important because we have Excellent. big, big days. Our biggest days of the year yeah. used to die off three days before Halloween. Now they keep going. We get an extra two big days. And if you think of that for actually every little occasion, so everyone who's buying a costume for the weekend, They used to have to have made their decision by Wednesday or they went to a brick and mortar store because that's the only way they can get it. Now they can keep buying yeah. from us until Friday. So we're getting another like two days out of the week, which is like 20% out of the week. So wow. in our category, which is impulse or uh, not impulse, I would say urgent panic, it's the speed of yeah, delivery just, uh, opens up much bigger I mean, markets. Who plans buying a costume uh, weeks in advance? There's something come on. Yeah, we'll find something and then you go to your cupboard as the artist on so boring stuff. So what should well, I do? Well, you know, people are very different and we have the data to prove this. There is a small number of American and, and it's American women. You see American women Halloween searches start in late July and then it grows. <laughs> and so because there's enough people, you can see the statistics of how it comes. And then the men come in later, but there's some men start planning ahead in late August, but the majority of men are in about the last three days. So yeah, well, the statistics don't lie. Like, sounds like a fun business you're in. Yeah, I definitely know next time when I need something, where to get a costume for my next <laughs> fancy dress party. That's correct. Before we wrap up, is there anything, any tips you would like to give starters, founders who said, hey, I'm looking for a cool idea or I have a cool idea and I want to bring it to the market. What is your biggest learning? My biggest learning is the one that got us going, which is to create the hypothesis Back it up with as yeah. much evidence as you can, test it quickly and cheaply and scale it if you can scale it. And then have high standards. We've kept mm. businesses going, which were just about viable and it's hard work. You keep pushing and you keep pushing and you just about get there. Whereas actually go and stop 
go and find that mega idea, the idea where it just goes crazy, where you can't keep up with the demand. You'll be so grateful that you did that because it is so much easier than just keeping pushing at a marginal idea. It's almost much easier when you have one that obviously doesn't work. And we've all had plenty of ideas that don't work. And you can tell there's no chance of keeping it going. The ones that are difficult are those ones in the middle that are just about viable, but you don't really want them. You want the really, really good ideas. So that'd be my biggest tip. Keep testing till you find cool. one of them. Awesome. Hey, very inspiring conversation. I learned a lot and I will definitely check out your store and yeah, wish you lots of fun growing this even further. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's been really fun talking to you. Thanks, Fraser. Hey, I'd like to make a quick announcement. I've got something exciting to share. As a listener of the High Performance CEO Show, you are already part of a community that values growth, excellence and pushing boundaries. I created the High Performance CEO Hub, which is a free community where you can connect with me and other listeners, get behind the scenes insights, learn how to improve performance and efficiency, and find accountability partners to grow together. Go to www.thehighperformanceceohub.com and join us today. It's free, it's valuable, and It's waiting for you.